Hey, I was asked a really good question and I, I just want to take a moment to, to kind of walk through it because I think this is, this is something that every believer at some point in time asks. Uh, the question I was asked was, how do I know the difference between a dream that God gives me versus a dream that I have created for myself? That is an amazing question. That's actually a question that I've asked myself like hundreds of times. Um, I didn't necessarily use that language. The language I used was, what's the difference between God's plan for me versus wishful thinking? I think as human beings, we, you know, we all have hopes, we have dreams, we have futures that we envision for ourselves. And then sometimes we see opportunities that are starting to come up and they're starting to arise. And uh, we think, well, is this, is this it? Is this what God has for me? Or is this, this, is this me just tricking myself, right? And, uh, and I, I have a little of anxiety uh, in the idea that I, I, I don't want to do the wrong thing. You know, I, um, sometimes I get analysis paralysis where I get so stuck on, oh no, I have a choice to make and I don't know which one is clearly, clearly the right choice. So I just won't make any choice and I'll just lay in bed all day and uh, just wig out because choices have to be made and I don't know which one's the right choice. So that's a really relatable question. And I think the reason why that's so relatable is that if you have been walking with Christ, if you've been going to church long enough, um, you probably know that uh, we can't trust ourselves. We, we as fallen human beings, you know, we are still marred by sin and there are times that we can look at a situation and we try to angle it. We try to push a situation um, outside of what God had intended and we get in trouble. Uh, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Your heart, my heart, you know, it's sick, it's wicked, it, it lies to us, and it's something that we can't trust. And so maybe maybe you're one of the you know millions of people who who just know, man, I, I want to do what God calls me to do, and I don't necessarily know um, if the opportunity that's in front of me is what God has for me. And so yeah, so that's a really good question. So if we're going to walk through this question, uh, I guess I'm just going to share some free flowing thoughts that I thought about. Cause I, I, like I said, I have, I've gone through that. I, I continue to go through that. That's a question I ask myself every time, um, an opportunity crops up. And, and if I were to be honest, um, I specifically ask that question, um, whenever a relationship is a possibility and I go, is this the person that God has for me? Because things are starting to, you know, work out or, you know, go that direction and it's something that I want. And uh, I ask myself really, like I ask myself that question because I don't want to be unequally yoked either, you know? Um, and I've run into way too many people who, did not follow their convictions and tricked themselves into a situation that they should not have been in. So, all right, so if we're gonna talk about this, uh, I wanna lay down a couple foundational thoughts. So first off, let's just talk about desires in general, okay? One of the, one of the things that we should probably know is that we have desires, right? As human beings, we, we have desires to be married, to be taken care of, to see the world, to travel, you know, some, some desires are kind of earthly, some of them are, are, are spiritual. Are, are they wrong in and of themselves? No, it, it's, it's about how we go about them, right? So I guess here when you say that, that like, God has given you desires. You have desires on your heart. And anecdotally, most, most likely, they are desires um, that God has given you. So as, as a matter of fact, even the things that we would talk about as like fleshy, evil desires, what typically makes a desire evil isn't the desire in and of itself. It's usually how we go about doing that, right? Um, I say that and I just realized like if someone has a desire to murder, um, that is evil and in and of itself, there's no like, <laughs> I'm talking about like, I guess to clarify, I'm talking about like wholesome, like life affirming desires. So uh, that's, that's what we're talking about. So, 
Psalm 37, verse 4. And Psalm 37 is, is my psalm. Um, another time, maybe I'll make a video about this, but especially when I was a senior in high school, getting ready to go off to college or not even going to college just yet because I had to stay uh, at my hometown and for an extra two years to do LCC or a community college. I got, I felt like life was just changing all around me. All my friends were moving on or stepping into things and situations that I wanted for myself. And whether that be relationships or careers or schooling, the biggest thing at that age is I just wanted to move out of town. And I didn't get to do that at that moment. And I felt like life was leaving me behind. And Psalm 37 just, it, it was my anchor through that season. As a matter of fact, even now, as, as an adult, as I have been you know, getting older, uh, Psalm 37 is something I still hold on to because there are, well, spe I guess specifically uh, verses three and four are, are things I hold on to. But anyway, I digress. Maybe another, if, if, if someone's watching this and they go, man, Andrew, I wanna hear you talk about Psalm 37 at some point in time, let me know and I'll, maybe I'll make a video about that. As a matter of fact, actually, I, uh, I was asked to speak at a baccalaureate this last school year, uh, this, at the beginning of the summer, and my message was on Psalm 37. So anyway, man, I am hardcore tangent. So, all right, let's talk about desires. Psalm 37, verse 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So a couple things here. Bible says he will give you the desires of your heart. So we know that our hearts have desires. And even here, the Bible says that God, God wants to give you the desires of your heart. Now, before we start going on like a prosperity gospel thing, um, well, okay, actually, let's back up here because the most important thing is how that verse starts. Verse four starts with, delight yourself in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord, as in let God be the answer to your joy and your happiness. Don't look to material things, don't look to relationships, don't look to our families, don't look to our, our socioeconomic situation or our political situations, don't look to our entertainment as the things that we delight in to make us happy. Our delight is in God. And when we delight ourselves in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, there are a lot of people who, um, a lot of commentators will talk about this because uh, some of the caveats here is like, if we take the time to, to delight ourselves in God, our heart's desires are molded and shaped and they're changed. Our, our desires become the desires of what God wants for us. And of course, to, to, to further his kingdom and to glorify his name, he's going to answer the desires of our heart. But I bring this up specifically to just talk about the idea that, yes, we have desires laid upon our hearts. And odds are, if you're watching this, you probably are thinking of, of, about, you're thinking about a desire that isn't evil, you just have a desire that's on your heart and you're wondering, the opportunity that you're facing right now, is this how God is going to answer this? Is this the vision I have for myself or is it, you know, is it wishful thinking? Is this, is this what I'm making for myself or is it something that actually God has for me? So again, number one, you have desires and that's not bad to have desires, but those desires though, you should understand that those desires are the very thing God uses to get a hold of our attention, to draw us closer to him. This, this is what I mean by that. So in the Bible, uh, Genesis, uh, one of my favorite people in the Bible is Abraham because that guy just didn't get it <laughs> for the longest time. And I, I find a lot of uh, myself in his story, okay? so. Abraham sets off to go become the father of nations. He, uh, he's following God. 
step by step and God promises to bless him and to make his descendants more numerous than, than the sands. And it's, it's a great promise that, that, that Abraham has been given by God. And he goes, and he goes, and um, there are times he faces other nations, other kings, and he gets into situations where it's hard and, and it's awkward, but he comes out on top and he's, he's blessed. And there's a point in time in his life in, in Genesis where he looks at everything that he has, and everything's great. He has money, he has land, he has um, family, he's got his wife, he's got Lot. Things, things are good. He's, he's looking quite prosperous. But in his heart, in his heart, there is a desire that has yet to be fulfilled, and that is he doesn't have an heir. He doesn't have a son. And he's kind of, kind of confused because God has been promising that he's going to, um, that God is going to bless Abraham and make his descendants greater, greater, more numerous than the stars, more numerous than the sand, the sand of the, the, the beaches and stuff. And so we see here that this is a longing that Abraham has. Well, it's through that longing that God shows up that God speaks and that God draws him near, right? There are times when uh, it, God shows up and, um, or yeah, God shows up and says, hey, I know you have this desire and I'm going to bless you with this. I'm going to help you with this. I'm going to give you a son. And Abraham and Sarah, the first go around, there's some doubt. Uh, Sarah laughs and, you know, thinks that she's too old to even have a kid. And so both Abraham and Sarah, um, they have this idea like, hey, you know, God says he's going to help us. He's going to finally give us a kid. Let's, let's help God answer our desires. Let's, let's go ahead and, um, you know, God says we're going to have a kid. I'm physically not capable of doing that. So let's, let's figure out how we can answer this. Let's help God answer our need. And so, you know, then we get the story of Hagar and Ishmael, right? And it's through all that that um, God shows up. It's like, hey, what are you doing? I told you to trust me. And, and Abraham learns, right? It's, it's through that pain of doubt and God confronting him, and God molding him, shaping him, that Abraham continues to learn. To the point that finally, uh, just as God says, when he's the one at the appointed time, at the appointed time, Sarah has, Sarah has a, a child, Isaac, and it's exactly what God intended for them. But then, but then, there's a point in time that God shows up and says, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice Isaac. This one thing that you have been wanting, the one thing that you have been desiring, I want you to sacrifice that to me. And then, you know, if you're familiar with the Bible, it, it goes through the story of Abraham and Isaac going and they're getting ready to sacrifice. And Isaac's a little suspicious. He's like, hey, you know, we don't have an animal. What's, what's like, how are we going to make this sacrifice? And uh, Abraham's like, God's going to provide, you know, and God, well, Abraham goes to sacrifice Isaac. And in the last second, God stops Abraham and provides, a, I believe, a ram. And then they then they're able to, uh, you know, sacrifice that, that 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 ram. I bring that story up because throughout the journey of Abraham's life, it's through that desire. That desire is what brings Abraham to his knees. That desire is what, that longing in his heart is what causes Abraham to look to God. And as Abraham struggles with faith, right? The first time he goes to a king and he doesn't trust God to, to protect him, so he lies about his wife. And then God's like, what are you doing? I told you I'd protect you. And Abraham's like, oh, I'm sorry, my bad. I, <coughs> whoops. And then he finds himself in a situation again. And then Abraham lies again. <laughs> and all that to say is like, Abraham goes from a person of, of not trusting God 
to the point that Abraham finally gets the very thing that he has been longing for, and his faith has grown so much. His experience with God has grown so much that he can follow through in obedience and sacrifice the one thing that he has been wanting this whole time. That's how his relationship grew. So much so that even though when we see the story of Abraham, we think to ourselves, man, this guy doesn't trust God. He doesn't have a lot of faith. And yet we go to the New Testament in Hebrews and he is considered a faithful servant, that he has the, the, um, the reputation of being faithful. So this is what I'm sharing with you. You have desires. You have deep, heartfelt desires. And you probably even have a vision for yourself as to how, how things could play out. Your desires, if, as long as you have been following with the Lord, they are informed by God. They are good desires. And there's a season in your life and I don't know how long that season is going to be, but God is going to just promise to answer that desire over and over and over again. And the reason why he's doing that, as we see in, in with Abraham's life and anecdotally in my own life, is that that's the very thing that's going to finally cause you to draw to your knees and actually engage in building a relationship with God. Let me say it like this, because I, I can relate to this so, so well. My, my heart's desire, man, there is like, I'm a, I was gonna say I'm a planner, and depending on who you talk to, they would argue that I'm not. But um, I am a visionary person. I, you know, in high school, I was that kid who has a five-year plan. Every couple of years, I have a new plan. I have uh, things, I'm very intentional. There are things I, I, I dream up for myself and I wanna to work towards and I'm, I'm gonna do whatever it takes to, to go that way. And I'm open-handed with my plans because I know things can go sideways and you just gotta roll with the punches. And I, there's a lot of things I've set up to do and I have loved um, the challenges of it. But the one thing that hasn't happened for me yet and please, like, I'm about to put this on the internet, and I don't need the pity of, of like, oh no, Andrew. Like, I, I'm at peace with this. For the very reason I'm, about, I'm sharing this, actually. The one thing that hasn't happened for me yet is I, I, I'm not a husband, and I'm not a father. Um, that used to bug me a lot, especially, like, in college and things. Especially when you're younger, in, you know, early 20s, you you think life should work out a certain way, and everyone else is getting married, or, and there's a lot of pressure in that. Listen, my desire to find my person is what has drawn me closer to the Lord more than anything else. You know, I, I have faced some health issues and I was like, God, you got this. I, I, I have faced financial issues and I'm like, God, you got this. Uh, my family has gone through a lot of hardships and aches and I'm like, you know what, God, you got this. But there have been times when I have met someone or I started to date and I'm like, okay, here we go, God, this is it. This is the person and it doesn't work out or, or I try and it doesn't even, the relationship doesn't even take off at all. And instead of me going, oh God, you got this. I go, why God, don't you love me? Don't you understand my heart's desires? You, you gave me this desire to be a husband and a father. Why can't I have that now? I, I met this person and they, 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 check the, they check off all the boxes and it's not working out. Lord, and, and I spiral into uh, just a lot of self-deprecating thoughts or doubt and frustration and I'm like hurt and I'm scared and you know I get these ideas of like oh no maybe I've missed the boat like I, it, it it's it's wild it's wild like the the thoughts I, I get I, it's really rare that I'll find any other situation 
where if it blows up in my face, that's how I respond. But when it comes to specifically finding my wife and the potential of finally being a, a husband, um, that's the thing that I start to flip out on. But it's those very, th it's those very things that have caused me to grow in my relationship with God, to grow in trust, to grow in how I seek, how I handle the word, how I pray and how I seek, I already said seek, but like, yeah, how I wrestle with God to the point that God is so intimate, so near that I, I can face frustrations in, in, um, when relationships don't work out and it's, I'm not gonna say easy, but it's much easier for me to just trust. Like, you know what, God, that person wasn't the right person for me and I can just keep trucking. So I, I bring that up to you because the question is, how do I know the difference, right? How do I know the difference between a dream that God has given me versus a dream that I've made up for myself? Well, God gives us our desires and where we go wrong is the details, right? The 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 devils are the devils in the details, I guess, is probably not the right expression for that. So the idea is that God has given you these desires and He has a plan. And probably it's possible that it's in that desire that God is finally grabbing a hold of your atten your attention. That every time you're in a, a season of turmoil and frustration, that God's saying, Hey, you know, I, I do have a plan for you, and I have, I want to answer this desire, but I, I want to mold you and shape you. I want you to know me above all other things. And so now that I have your attention, I want to walk with you. I want to reveal who I am to you. The, the faith is about glorifying God, and it's through our personal relationship with him as he reveals himself and we respond in obedience and faith to him. So, how do we know the difference? So let's, let's go back to that. Sorry if I'm rambling. You know the difference through the most cliche thing any, any Christian could say. And that is through prayer and reading the word. That's how you know. And I, I'm sure there are people who just roll their eyes just now because that, like I said, that's, that's the most cliche thing. But actually it's, it's the cliche, but it's also the most foundational thing that we can, we can talk about. Because oftentimes, you know, when we say things like, hey, I'm praying for you or I'm seeking God on this, like how, how badly are we actually seeking God? I shared that, that story just now or the illustration of like my own life. And I can tell you like every time I met someone who I thought was going to be my wife, um, my ability to seek God and my intimacy in how I prayed for him, prayed to him, increased. You know, it went from like, I used to just pray and like, hey God, as I'm driving around, you know, what do you think of this person? You know, praying at every meal, you know, to uh, there would be nights where I would go and I would like, because I'm a pastor, I have access to our, our church. I would go middle of the night to our sanctuary and just, just get on my hands and my knees and just cry out to God and just seek him hard to the point now where even now um, in this last year, I've been reading this book on, on prayer toward, I'm at a point where like my prayer life is intimate, I guess this is a word I'd have to use. It starts with just meditation and just ruminating on who God is and just reminding myself that he is my father and knowing his presence and then entering into his presence, I guess. And it, it's more than just me saying a couple of prayers while I'm like working on something. That, that's still part of my prayer life, right? Pray without ceasing. But there is a, a sit down and a God, I'm giving you my full attention aspect to it. And it's deep. And it's deeper than it's ever been because every time I went through the possibility of trying to figure out if this is my heart's desire being answered or not, it this is what draw, drew me closer. <clears throat> so, it, so it starts with prayer. And I think we need to remember that prayer. 
I want to make sure I say this correctly because it's prayer is a huge topic, right? Part of prayer is us bringing our petitions to God and giving him our desires. Saying, God, there's, here's a possibility. Here's something that I want. And part of that is saying, God, I trust you, though. If this isn't what you have for me, uh, I'm just going to trust that you are my father and that you love me and that you have my best interest in mind for your glory. So if this doesn't work out the way I, I want it to work out, I can trust that you have a better plan for me, right? So we can bring our petitions to him and then trust in the results to him, right? But also part of prayer is just laying out our hearts and saying, God, I'm a broken person and I don't, I can't trust myself. So this is what I want. And what I would love, Lord, is if you could change my heart so that I can align with what your will is, so that I can glorify your name, right? That's, that's that whole idea of delighting yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. When we come to him and we say, God, we know that you are the source of my joy, my hope, my future, and all these things, and that I'm broken and I can't always trust who I am. So I'm, I know that you are the source. So if I'm laying this out before you, just change me. Change my desires so it's molded and shaped by your word and your will. And so when then you provide, you know, when you answer the desire of my heart, man, may you be glorified in that. So that's prayer. You gotta pray about it. You gotta pray about it. And then you gotta be in the word. You have to be in the word. And I know, I know there are a lot of people right now who are like, Andrew, I know the Bible is important. I know that's God's word. But man, I just like, I just can't get myself to read and I just can't get myself to like enjoy it or even like uh, engage in it in a meaningful way. Well, buddy, if you want your heart's desire, wouldn't it be worth it to, to pay the price? Nothing worth having comes easy. And I guess that's what I mean by my story earlier is that out of all the people that I have loved and, and desired for them to be my wife, it drove me to my knees to the point that I hungered and thirst for God because I desperately needed to hear from him. Like how bad do you want your dream? How bad do you want your desire that you wouldn't be willing to do whatever it took, right? That, that's how I see it. So like if I, <laughs> these women that I, that I like that stole my heart, that I, like, I wanted to, to marry, like they were worth it to me. They were, it was worth it to me to get up, to read the Bible, to ask questions, to seek answers from my pastor and just to dig deep, to, to give up on um, spending time on Facebook or video games so that I could finally find whether or not, is this who God has for me? Lord, speak to me. And that drove me to the word. And here's the thing, we, we need to be in the word because again, our hearts are wicked. And there are a lot of people who will quote unquote pray and then use their feelings to justify their actions. Years ago, when I, <clears throat> when I was just entering into the ministry, I was like 19 or so, I had a friend who dated a girl and then they broke up. And then this girl who was a brand new believer at some point in time started dating another guy who was like a believer. <laughs> and they, um, they fell in lust. Not love, lust. And uh, at some point in time, she got pregnant. And we were just talking through it and trying not to be like super judgmental and stuff, but just trying to understand the situation. Uh, we were talking and she was like, you know, Andrew, we, we, uh, we go to church and we, we, we love each other and we prayed about it. And we realized that, that God was okay with us, you know, starting our family um, and, and not getting married. And that relationship dissolved, actually. Like, they, that kid, I don't know if the dad is in the picture or not. <laughs> my point in that story, <laughs> my point in that story is you, unless you are in the word, You, like, you're not going to hear from God. 
like Spirit of God convicts, it counsels, it molds us, it shapes us, it does all those things. But it does so in tandem with the amount of knowledge that we have of God's word. So if we're not desperately seeking him by opening up his word, right? God, God moves through speaking, like his Bible, like this, the Bible is God actually talking to us. That's how we'll know the difference between what God has for us versus something that we've made up for ourselves. And here's the thing, I guess going back to prayer, I'm sorry, I'm jumping back a little bit. Um, Jeremiah 17, 10, right? So the verse right after the whole, the heart is deceitful. Jeremiah writes, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. God tests our hearts and our minds. And how we are able to test our hearts and our minds is by lining up our desires with what God has plainly said in his word. So where does this, where does this leave us, right? It's not a simple like, hey, maybe it is. Maybe it is a simple like, God, I desire to murder. Should I go ahead and do that? No. Right. And that's just, we know that's not the right thing. But maybe the situation, your desire is um, more wholesome and more nuanced than that. And you're thinking, God, I, I want, this is a situation that I want. You know I wanted this. You put this desire on my heart. Is this you answering that? Well, you need to pray about it. And when I say pray about it, I mean like, you, you need to get on your knees. You need to grow in your relationship with God. You need to dial it up to the next level of things. You know, maybe you're the kind of person who prays while you're driving. Or you're the kind of person who prays while you're, you're working out or you go for walks. Great. But maybe the next step for you is to actually fast. To fast. To give something up to a meal a day or something like that and take that time to to sit and kneel and fall before God. Or maybe maybe the next step for you is to actually like be on your hands or be face down crying out to God and just showing that devotion, I guess, right? When God is our absolute, our attention. And then the other thing is you need to be in the word. You do. And that's, that can be hard, right? I, I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, just open up the Bible and God talks to you because there is, the Bible's big and we need direction at times. And so talk to, talk to believers and get, get a heading, get a direction, but just be in the word. Matter of fact, like for me, like I, this happens so frequently nowadays, especially in the last year or so that as I wrestle, right? As I wrestle with God, as I have questions about him, I go when I go to services, when I go to where I know God's word is going to be teaching or being, where, where I know God's word is being taught, I go expecting to hear from God. So I go and I take notes and I go, God, I, I know you are, you speak through the preaching of your word. I know that you go, you speak through the teaching of your word. I know that you, you speak when we crack it open and we're reading things like speak to me. I want to hear you. And that's why I go, I take notes. I'm engaged the whole time because I want to hear from God because there are some deep things I'm sorting through. And man, God shows up. God shows up and he speaks. He convicts. He inspires. He informs. He counsels me. And to be clear, it's not always about the topic I'm talking about. Sometimes through other, like through, through these mediums, God convicts me about something that I had never even thought about before. I'm like, oh man, maybe I do need to take a look at my finances again. But as I step through in hearing him being repentant and then stepping through in faith, I'm just being drawn closer and closer. So that's just a plus, right? The closer I get to God, the more obvious something is going to be if something is of me versus if something is of him. I should just land this plane because I think, I, I hope this is helpful. And if it's, um, if you need clarity, you know, write me 
ask me questions, shoot me an email, text me if you know my number or you know, leave a comment or something and we can talk a little bit more. But yeah, I, I just would say like, if, if you were wrestling, embrace the wrestle, don't give up hope. It's through your desire that God wants to reveal himself to you. So engage in that. I'm going to return back to the story of Abraham. Abraham, had a, he had a desire. And he went on a journey. And he went on situations where um, he didn't. He didn't follow through with what God called him to do. And yet God was gracious. He showed up and God continued to mold that relationship to bless Abraham and draw him closer. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's not about your desire being answered. It's about you coming to know the God of the universe who loves you so deeply, who through your story and your testimony will be glorified. So, If there is a struggle before you and a challenge to go deeper into prayer and reading his word, I mean, I would, I hope you know, I guess, that this desire that's on your heart, that's what God is using to draw you closer. And I hope that as you grow in your relationship with him, even if it doesn't work out the way you were hoping it would, because that happens, I'm proof of that. God is still good and you can trust him. And he's going to grow your trust in him. He's got you.